Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. Chapter Seventeen. Cut-offs and Stephen. These dry details are of importance in one particular. They give me an opportunity of introducing one of the Mississippi's oddest peculiarities, that of shortening its length from time to time. If you will throw a long, pliant apple paring over your shoulder, it will pretty fairly shape itself into an average section of the Mississippi, that is, the nine or ten hundred miles stretching from Cairo, Illinois, southward to New Orleans the same being wonderfully crooked, with a brief straight bit here and there, at wide intervals. The two hundred mile stretch from Cairo northward to St. Louis is by no means so crooked, that being a rocky country which the river cannot cut much. The water cuts the alluvial banks of the lower river into deep horseshoe curves, so deep, indeed, that in some places, if you were to get ashore at one extremity of the horseshoe and walk across the neck, half or three-quarters of a mile, you could sit down and rest a couple of hours, while your steamer was coming round the long elbow at a speed of ten miles an hour, to take you aboard again. When the river is rising fast, some scoundrel whose plantation is back in the country, and therefore of inferior value, has only to watch his chance cut a little gutter across the narrow neck of land some dark night, and turn the water into it, and in a wonderfully short time a miracle has happened. To wit, the whole Mississippi has taken possession of that little ditch, and placed the countryman's plantation on its bank, quadrupling its value, and that other party's formerly valuable plantation finds itself away out yonder on a big island and the old water-course around it will soon shoal up. Boats cannot approach within ten miles of it, and down goes its value to a fourth of its former worth. Watches are kept on those narrow necks at needful times, and if a man happens to be caught cutting a ditch across them, the chances are all against his ever having another opportunity to cut a ditch. Pray observe some of the effects of this ditching business. Once there was a neck opposite Port Hudson, Louisiana, which was only half a mile across, in its narrowest place. You could walk across there in fifteen minutes. But if you made the journey around the Cape on a raft, you travelled thirty-five miles to accomplish the same thing. In 1722 the river darted through that neck, deserted its old bed, and thus shortened itself thirty-five miles. In the same way it shortened itself twenty-five miles at Black Hawk Point in 1699. Below Red River Landing, Recoursey Cut-Off was made, forty or fifty years ago, I think. This shortened the river twenty-eight miles. In our day, if you travel by river from the southernmost of these three cut-offs to the northernmost, you go about seventy miles. To do the same thing a hundred and seventy-six years ago, one had to go a hundred and fifty-eight miles, shortening of eighty-eight miles in that trifling distance. At some forgotten time in the past, cut-offs were made above Vidalia, Louisiana, at Island 92, at Island 84, and at Hales Point. These shortened the river, in the aggregate, seventy-seven miles. Since my own day on the Mississippi, cut-offs have been made at Hurricane Island, at Island 100, at Napoleon, Arkansas, at Walnut Bend, and at Council Bend. These shortened the river, in the aggregate, sixty-seven miles. In my own time a cut-off was made at American Bend, which shortened the river ten miles or more. Therefore the Mississippi between Cairo and New Orleans was twelve hundred and fifteen miles long one hundred and seventy-six years ago. It was eleven hundred and eighty after the cut-off of 1722, it was one thousand and forty after the American Bend cut-off, it has lost sixty-seven miles since, consequently its length is only nine hundred and seventy-three miles at present. Now if I wanted to be one of those ponderous scientific people, and let on to prove what had occurred in the remote past, by what had occurred in a given time in the recent past, or what will occur in the far future by what has occurred in late years, what an opportunity is here! 
geology never had such a chance, nor such exact data to argue from, nor development of species, either. Glacial epochs are great things, but they are vague, vague. Please observe. In the space of one hundred and seventy-six years the lower Mississippi has shortened itself two hundred and forty-two miles. That is an average of a trifle over one mile and a third per year. Therefore any calm person who is not blind or idiotic can see that in the old oolitic Silurian period, just a million years ago next November, the lower Mississippi River was upwards of one million three hundred thousand miles long, and stuck out over the Gulf of Mexico like a fishing rod. And by the same token, any person can see that seven hundred and forty two years from now, the lower Mississippi will only be a mile and three quarters long, and Cairo and New Orleans will have joined their streets together, and be plodding comfortably along under a single mayor and a mutual board of aldermen. There is something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact. When the water begins to flow through one of those ditches I have been speaking of, it is time for the people thereabouts to move. The water cleaves the banks away like a knife. By the time the ditch has become twelve or fifteen feet wide, the calamity is as good as accomplished for no power on earth can stop it now. When the width has reached a hundred yards, the banks begin to peel off in slices half an acre wide. The current flowing around the bend traveled formerly only five miles an hour. Now it is tremendously increased by the shortening of the distance. I was on board the first boat that tried to go through the cut-off at American Bend, but we did not get through. It was toward midnight and a wild night it was, thunder, lightning, and torrents of rain. It was estimated that the current in the cut-off was making about fifteen or twenty miles an hour. Twelve or thirteen was the best our boat could do, even in tolerably slack water. Therefore, perhaps, we were foolish to try the cut-off. However, Mr. Brown was ambitious, and he kept on trying. The eddy running up the bank, under the point, was about as swift as the current out in the middle. So we would go flying up the shore like a lightning express train, get on a big head of steam, and stand by for a surge when we struck the current that was whirling by the point. But all our preparations were useless. The instant the current hit us, it spun us around like a top. The water deluged the forecastle, and the boat careened so far over that one could hardly keep his feet. The next instant we were away down the river, clawing with might and main to keep out of the woods. We tried the experiment four times. I stood on the forecastle companionway to see. It was astonishing to observe how suddenly the boat would spin around and turn tail the moment she emerged from the eddy, and the current struck her nose. The sounding concussion and the quivering would have been about the same if she had come full steam against a sandbank. Under the lightning flashes one could see the plantation cabins and the goodly acres tumble into the river, and the crash they made was not a bad effort at thunder. Once, when we spun around, we only missed a house about twenty feet that had a light burning in the window, and in the same instant that house went overboard. Nobody could stay on our forecastle. The water swept across it in a torrent every time we plunged athwart the current. At the end of our fourth effort we brought up in the woods two miles below the cut-off. All the country there was overflowed, of course. A day or two later the cut-off was three-quarters of a mile wide, and boats passed up through it without much difficulty, and so saved ten miles. The old Recoursey cut-off reduced the river's length twenty-eight miles. There used to be a tradition connected with it. It was said that a boat came along there in the night, and went around the enormous elbow the usual way, the pilots not knowing that the cut-off had been made. It was a grisly, hideous night, and all shapes were vague and distorted. The old bend had already begun to fill up, and the boat got to running away from mysterious reefs and occasionally hitting one. The perplexed pilots fell to swearing, and finally uttered the entirely unnecessary wish that they might never get out of that place. 
as always happens in such cases that particular prayer was answered and the others neglected so to this day that phantom steamer is still butting around in that deserted river trying to find her way out more than one grave watchman has sworn to me that on drizzly dismal nights he has glanced fearfully down that forgotten river as he passed the head of the island and seen the faint glow of the spectre steamer's lights drifting through the distant gloom and heard the muffled cough of her escape pipes and the plaintive cry of her leadsman in the absence of further statistics i beg to close this chapter with one more reminiscence of stephen most of the captains and pilots held stephen's note for borrowed sums ranging from two hundred and fifty dollars upward stephen never paid one of these notes but he was very prompt and very zealous about renewing them every twelve months of course there came a time at last when stephen could no longer borrow of his ancient creditors so he was obliged to lie and wait for new men who did not know him such a victim was good-hearted simple-natured young yates i use a fictitious name but the real name began as this one does with a y young yates graduated as a pilot got a berth and when the month was ended and he stepped up to the clerk's office and received his two hundred and fifty dollars in crisp new bills stephen was there his silvery tongue began to wag and in a very little while yates two hundred and fifty dollars had changed hands the fact was soon known at pilot's headquarters and the amusement and satisfaction of the old creditors were large and generous but innocent yates never suspected that stephen's promise to pay promptly at the end of the week was a worthless one yates called for his money at the stipulated time stephen sweetened him up and put him off a week he called then according to agreement and came away sugar-coated again but suffering under another postponement so the thing went on yates haunted stephen week after week to no purpose and at last gave it up and then straightway stephen began to haunt yates wherever yates appeared there was the inevitable stephen and not only there but beaming with affection and gushing with apologies for not being able to pay by and by whenever poor yates saw him coming he would turn and fly and drag his company with him if he had company but it was of no use his debtor would run him down and corner him panting and red-faced stephen would come with outstretched hands and eager eyes invade the conversation shake both of yates arms loose in their sockets and begin my what a race i've had i saw you didn't see me and so i clapped on all steam for fear i'd miss you entirely and here you are there just stand so and let me look at you just the same old noble countenance to yates friend just look at him look at him ain't it just good to look at him ain't it now ain't he just a picture some call him a picture i call him a panorama that's what he is an entire panorama and now i'm reminded how i do wish i could have seen you an hour earlier for twenty-four hours i've been saving up that two hundred and fifty dollars for you been looking for you everywhere i waited at the planters from six yesterday evening till two o'clock this morning without rest or food my wife says where have you been all night i said this debt lies heavy on my mind she says in all my days i never saw a man take a debt to heart the way you do i said it's my nature how can i change it she says well do go to bed and get some rest i said not till that poor noble young man has got his money so i set up all night and this morning out i shot and the first man i struck told me you had shipped on the grand turk and gone to new orleans well sir i had to lean up against a building and cry so help me goodness i couldn't help it the man that owned the place come out cleaning up with a rag and said he didn't like to have people cry against his building and then it seemed to me that the whole world had turned against me and it wasn't any use to live any more and coming along an hour ago suffering no man knows what agony i met jim wilson and paid him the two hundred and fifty dollars on account and to think that here you are now and i haven't got a cent but as sure as i am standing here on this ground on this particular brick there i've scratched a mark on the brick to remember it by 
I'll borrow that money and pay it over to you at twelve o'clock sharp tomorrow. Now stand so. Let me look at you just once more." And so on. Yates' life became a burden to him. He could not escape his debtor, and his debtor's awful sufferings on account of not being able to pay. He dreaded to show himself in the street, lest he should find Stephen lying in wait for him at the corner. Bogart's billiard saloon was a great resort for pilots in those days. They met there about as much to exchange river news as to play. One morning Yates was there. Stephen was there, too, but kept out of sight. But by and by, when about all the pilots had arrived who were in town, Stephen suddenly appeared in the midst, and rushed for Yates as for a long-lost brother. "'Oh, I am so glad to see you! Oh, my soul, the sight of you is such comfort to my eyes! Gentlemen, I owe all of you money. Among you I owe probably forty thousand dollars. I want to pay it. I intend to pay it, every last cent of it. You all know, without my telling you, what sorrow it has cost me to remain so long under such deep obligations to such patient and generous friends. But the sharpest pang I suffer, by far the sharpest, is from the debt I owe to this noble young man here. And I have come to this place this morning especially to make the announcement that I have at last found a method whereby I can pay off all my debts. And most especially I wanted him to be here when I announced it. Yes, my faithful friend, my benefactor, I've found the method. I've found the method to pay off all my debts, and you'll get your money." Hope dawned in Yates' eye. Then Stephen, beaming benignantly, and placing his hand upon Yates' head, added, "'I am going to pay them off in alphabetical order.' Then he turned and disappeared. The full significance of Stephen's method did not dawn upon the perplexed and musing crowd for some two minutes. Then Yates murmured with a sigh, "'Well, the wise stand a gaudy chance. He won't get any further than the seas in this world, and I reckon that after a good deal of eternity has wasted away in the next one, I'll still be referred to up there as that poor ragged pilot that came here from St. Louis in the early days. End of chapter 17